Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chief Economics Commentator for the Wall Street Journal, Greg Ipp, and his panel. Good morning, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, so um, we meet on a wonderful morning in Washington, and the economy is a little shaky, but still looks pretty awesome. Unemployment 50-year low. Uh, this month, we entered possibly the longest business expansion in US history. Everything looks great, with one exception, the fiscal picture. It looks terrible. The debt to GDP ratio is at a, a post-war, uh, post-1950s high, and it seems to be headed higher. We're experiencing fiscal deficits uh, that are normally experienced only during recessions. And so the panel this morning is going to sort of challenge, it's going to ask that very sort of like existential question, is this, a bad, is this something to worry about? If so, why? And is it something not to worry about? And if not, why not? And to discuss these questions, we are blessed with a terrific panel. On my far left is Kent Smetters. He is a uh, professor at the Wharton School uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, and he is director of the Penn Wharton Budget Model. Uh, Next to him is Beth Ann Bavino. She is uh, US Chief Economist at S&P Global Ratings Group. If you're upset that S&P downgraded the United States a few years ago, you can bring it up with her afterwards. <laughs> uh, and then just to my left is Olivier Blanchard. He, is, uh, he goes by many titles. Currently, he is Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Before that, he was best known as Chief Economist of the IMF. Before that, as chair, Chairman of the Department of Economics at MIT and Doctoral Dissertation Advisor to, to, to approximately 50% of people with PhDs in this country. But <laughs> Olivier, your most recent title, if I may, is Enfant Terrible of Macroeconomics Vis-a-Vis -vis Fiscal Policy. And I say that because, uh, as, uh, as the audience may know, there's been a big rethink going on in economics about the dangers of debt. And you are kind of at the center of that debate. You gave a speech. I was there in front of thousands of people at the American Economic Association where you essentially turned conventional wisdom on its head and said that maybe the terrible things we think about with big debts aren't as terrible as we've come to believe. Can you lay out for us your thesis about why we need to rethink some of these assumptions about debt? Uh, with pleasure. The, um, and what led me to choose the topic of a speech I gave at the AEA meetings and to focus on, on this issue was the decrease in interest rates, safe interest rates, uh, since the uh, mid-80s, which continue fairly steadily and has continued. And if we believe markets, uh, is going to continue uh, for a long time. Uh, we now have rates which are historically extremely low and even more uh, strikingly lower than the growth rate. And so I realize this was... In other was words, if there's a, an interest rate of, a growth rate of 4% mm -hmm. nominal. Right, we are basically at 2.5%. Uh, uh, well, if you look 10 years out, 2.1 now. Uh, and probably a nominal growth rate of about 4%, right? 3.8. Uh, and I realized this was a very unusual environment. Uh, and it was worth just revisiting the basic theory of deficits and debt in that context. So it's a fairly academic paper with clearly uh, substantial implications for policy, and that's what I did. And if I were to summarize the uh, two conclusions that uh, I drew from that, the first one is the cost of debt is lower. That, that's nearly trivial. Both the fiscal cost of debt is lower because you pay lower interest rate, uh, so that debt dynamics are more appealing. Uh, that's the first one. So lower cost, fiscal cost, lower economic cost of debt because the fact that interest rates are so low is a signal, not a perfect signal, that maybe the marginal product of capital is not that high. So although that crowds out capital, which is the usual argument against debt, it may not be very costly if capital is not very productive. So on the first point, <coughs> the first point is lower cost. The second is this is an environment in which, and that's conceptually different but related, uh, monetary policy has much less room to play. Uh, in many countries, monetary policy basically has done everything it can. Uh, interest rates are very close to zero or even negative in some countries. And therefore, fiscal policy can do more. So the benefits of fiscal policy in that environment is that it can do something that monetary policy would have done in another context, but can't. So there might be larger benefits to using fiscal expansions uh, in that kind of environment. So lower cost, higher benefits. So this was basically the message. 
then what I've done since then is basically go around the world and look at the different situations and pontificate about various countries uh, from Japan to the EU to the US. And each country is different. I mean, Japan clearly is an extreme form of that, has negative nominal rates as the eye can see if you look at the yield curve. Uh, Europe is very close also to the minimum. In the US, the situation is not quite as bad. So if I may take a few more minutes to talk about the US, what are the implications of what I've said and thought about for the US? I think you have to distinguish between, say, the relatively short run, say the next five, ten years maybe at most, and then the longer run. So in the short run, I think the implication is we have large primary deficits at this point, and the question is should we reduce them? I think other things equal. Uh, if we could reduce them at no cost in terms of output, we should, but the issue is that there is not a whole lot of room even ignoring the risk of a recession, if we were to have a drastic fiscal consolidation over the next few years, the Fed would probably have to decrease interest rates to offset some of the decrease in demand, and the Fed might find itself again, either at the zero lower bound or at the rate that is not very pleasant. I think we all want the Fed to have a bit more margin to play with yeah. than being back at zero. So I think the conclusion for the US is in the absence of a recession, decrease the primary deficit uh, at a rate which does not put into question growth, which basically is a statement about the, the strength of private demand itself and the ability of the Fed to decrease interest rates. So I think at best it implies a very slow decrease in primary deficits. If there is a recession, my own view, we want to come back to this, the Fed doesn't have the ability to really handle a regular run-of-the-mill recession, and so fiscal policy should be used. In that context, I have no doubt that it has to be used. Yes, it might increase that, but not a catastrophe. So this is for the next five, ten years. For the longer run, uh, I was at the CBO advisory meeting on uh, Friday, and it's clear that there are trends which are extremely worrisome. Uh, and if nothing is done in terms of Social Security or Medicare or various other programs, we are on a trajectory of increasing debt and I can see no reason for wanting this. So it's clear here that my advice is very much the same advice, I think, as uh, the, the other uh, panel members, which is we have to think now about adjusting for social security benefits or contributions and for Medicare and various other aspects of the budget we have to start now. Uh, I have no desire to see that increase to 150%. So just to be clear, are you, you're not saying debt does not matter? That does matter. That, what, the way I've said this, you know, you try to find a sentence which characterizes what you think without, uh, without people being able to take it one way or the other. I'm not an MMT person. <laughs> I do not agree Modern with Modern monetary MMT. theory, the idea that you can uh, print your way The way, way I say it dead. is yeah. uh, that is bad, but not necessarily catastrophic. I think that captures what, sure. where I am. Ken, let me turn to you now. Of course, your model is a, a sort of a central workhouse model that we use to try and address the extent to which debt is harmful to the eco economy. And, you know, I'm very familiar with your work. And one of the mechanisms by which it always reminds policymakers about the trade-offs is the crowding out effect, is that when you run up the debt, that's money that's not available for private investment. Just how much do you agree with Olivier's broad point here? Do you think that perhaps he minimizes some of these harmful long-run effects? So we basically agree with Olivia on when it comes to per dollar, per dollar of debt, we agree that the cost per dollar has gone way down relative historic uh, levels. The borrowing rate is quite low. In our model, we actually have a real a maturity uh, weighted borrowing rate for government, slightly negative right now in our, in our model. Because and, and how does that compare historically? Uh, it's much lower than historically, uh, e easily 300 basis points lower than if you go to uh, pre-2008. And it li it Olivier, you, you mentioned backstage, I wasn't allowed to talk about marginal product at Capital, but Olivier <laughs> brought it up. And so, <laughs> in particular, the Overton this, window has moved. Sorry. That's right. And, he, you know, uh, Beth and I both read his textbook growing up. And so, um, if the textbook author is willing to say that. But the marginal product of capital is this idea. It's, it's simply that what is the return that private investors, given that they face risk, what do they require 
um, to invest in, in risky capital projects versus uh, something that's safer like government debt. And we uh, are currently uh, projecting, and we've been using this all the way <coughs> since the tax forms and uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and before, uh, marginal product of capital is about 350 basis points below what the uh, pre-2008 uh, simulation studies used to use. In particular, we're right now at this, uh, for 2020, at 5.4%. It does take up over time, but it, uh, by 2040, it's only going up to 6. 1% on a real basis, so quite a bit lower. The issue is the, simply the sheer size of debt. And in particular, we have the sheer size of debt uh, increasing quite a bit by 2050, uh, approaching about 190% of GDP. That's about 30% of GDP, a little bit uh, higher than CBO. There's various reasons why we're a little bit higher. But whether you use our number or CBO's number, the crowding out effect, that is uh, in, uh, households are deciding where do I invest my dollar? Do I put, in, put it into pr uh, private capital projects or do I buy government debt? Which, as Michael Peterson is opening remarks, reminds us that's really affording consumption today without paying for it today. Uh, it's really fast forwarding consumption. And the, it, that's still, even under these really favorable assumptions, and by the way, we also make other technical assumptions that, if anything, are very uh, debt friendly, very robust international capital flows, things that I don't actually completely believe, but the error on the side of, if anything, being debt friendly. We still find big crowding out effects. In particular, um, by uh, 2040, um, we're finding that uh, if we could just stabilize the current debt GDP ratio, not even go back to pre-2008 levels, just the current um, uh, debt GDP ratio of around 80%, uh, percent, we could stabilize that going forward. Um, we would have uh, pretty sizable increases in GDP um, it, it, that are um, you know, one to three percent of GDP. By 2050, we're talking about two to six percent growth in GDP. Um, if you put that in the context of like the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, we're talking about uh, a change about one to three times bigger than what you would get from a long-term uh, 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 package like a, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And it's so far that it's about the only policy of trying to figure out how to stabilize the debt GDP ratio. It's it, by f relative to other fiscal policies, it's still the biggest kicker in terms of stimulating the economy. So you're so you concur with Olivier that it may be a problem, but it's not catastrophic. In other words, it does its damage little bit by bit over a very long time. It's a death by a thousand cuts. Yep. And you know the really big issue too is that <coughs> we're doing everything on an expected outcome for this particular analysis. The risk factor is huge. Um, in, in particular, what happens if uh, the rest of the world doesn't see the U.S. as that safe, ubiquitous asset? What happens if the Japanese insurance companies decide we're not that safe? What happens if Beth downgrades no, or that even more? Um, you know, they're, Funny they're, you yeah, yeah, exactly. No. <laughs> but yeah, uh, a joke. you know, right now, you know, the it, it, places like Japan have very high savings rate. Places like the United States have very low household savings rate. I think we have a lot less flex flexibility uh, relative to other countries. But Beth Ann, that was perhaps not the way you would have wanted to be introduced, but nonetheless, I'm going to follow up on that <laughs> point. In fact, I well remember back in 2011, I was reporting on the fact when S&P downgraded the United States debt rating. And I do remember what happened to bond yields. They went down. And today, we, with the largest you know, peacetime debt to GDP ratio in modern US history, we're looking at real bond yields of around zero. It is very hard to see the bond, mar the bond market vigilantes are either dead or l euthanized, uh, uh, <laughs> sedated. And if the bond market's not getting worked up about our debt, why should we? What's, what, do you, what do you read into the bond market in terms of what we should or should not be worrying about with respect to our fiscal situation? Well, the, I mean, the bond market has um, certainly, the, the markets don't care until they do, for one thing. So let's see what happens. They didn't, they didn't respond to the debt ceiling crisis as well, um, largely because they thought the government would, you know, do the right thing after they've gone through every other option possible. And that probably is the same case this time as well. In terms of, in terms of where we are, you keep in mind that 
the U um, S and P Global downgraded the U S to double uh, A plus. Uh, that is still in very very high in terms of uh, investment grade, and there are other factors that went into that. Now, one of the big factors was governance, poor, uh, basically poorer governments uh, governance, and that really hasn't changed so much um, even today. Uh, the other things that are in play here, of course, we also have uh, when you look at the. SMP, I should note that I'm not a rating analyst, but I do work with them closely. Uh, we'd also want to say that the we have different factors that go, that are in play with our with our measure, our overall measure for the sovereign group, um, for the sovereign uh, debt uh, debt rating. Uh, one of them is the debt. Uh, that is actually at the lowest in terms of we have a factor of one to six in terms of high. One is the highest, six is the lowest. The debt, um, U.S. debt, government debt, is at the lowest. It's six. Can't go lower than that. Uh, the fiscal uh, the fiscal side of things is also, or the flow uh, factor is also at play there. That, um, that is still, ra that is rather low, not at the lowest it can go. But then there are other factors that go. When we talk about institutions, yes, governments, governance, particularly on Capitol Hill, lawmakers on Capitol Hill got it, um, gave, the, gave the sovereign rating a ding. But there are other institutions, the Federal Reserve, for example, uh, many other um, institutions in the U.S. government, which, which are still, you know, moving very well. Uh, and then the last thing to keep in mind that is actually a real strength for the U.S., and we don't see it changing anytime soon is the dollar is the reserve currency. Uh, when you think about the money, 60% of world reserves are in US is, are in, is in the US dollar and that gives the US government a significant give, gives the US a significant amount of cushion going forward. Well, let me actually address that last point about our institutions, right? And so in fact there's been a lot of discussion in the last week or two since the president threatened and then retracted the threat to put tariffs on Mexico because of the uh, immigration issue. You know, there's a variety of other things, you know, the United States are reimposing sanctions on Iran despite the fact that U.S. allies have not done the same. And there's a concern that the U.S., by essentially using these economic tools in a unilateral sense, is eventually going to give other countries incentives to work away or around the U.S. dominance of the global financial system. Uh, Britain and France, I believe, are working on an alternative dollar payment system to continue business with Iran. And then you mentioned the Federal Reserve. You know, there's been a lot of concern about the president's, uh, you know, very vociferous criticism of the Fed. He's been at it in just in the last day or two about some of the people he has contemplated nominating to the Federal Reserve. How much should we worry about the institutions of the United States, which are currently, as you say, a strength of the rating, actually turning into a weakness? Well, the U I mean, so the Federal Reserve certainly holds and, and very tightly holds to the fact that they are an independent body, and they, I, um, and and I think that will still hold. They certainly have make they hold that very tightly, and they continue to make that point. I do think that while the you know the you know the the president's uh, tweets on uh, the Federal Reserve and on uh, Chair Powell adds much more confusion to markets. Uh, it. it uh, it, it actually adds to the worry of market of credibility in terms of market market um, markets impressions. I don't think the Fed has changed their position because of that. I know there's an argument about did the Fed uh, decide to lower rates or decide to stay on hold because of the uh, because of what. President Trump is saying, I don't think that was the case at all. Although I do think that the market turbul turbulence um, could be at play in terms of the in terms of the Fed's decision. And is the market turbulence tied to some of the actions on Capitol Hill? Most likely so. So you're seeing kind of a circular effect there. But I do think that the um, institutions, particularly the Federal Reserve, still stand strong. Let's uh, turn the. I'd also might, I'd also want to add though. Remember the two the two um, the, the two nominees also didn't ever made it as well. So. Olivia, did you want to uh, add something? Yeah, on, on the risks. I mean, there are always risks when you have high debt, but the investors will basically get scared and, uh, and uh, run away. And sudden stops we've seen in many Latin American countries, and I worry about it. So two points here. The first one is how do you decrease these risks? And if you basically embark on a fiscal consolidation, which may have effect on output, and you decrease debt from, say, 120 to 118, which implies quite a bit of fiscal consolidation in, if you do it in a year. It's not going to basically change very much the objectively the risks. Uh, the others is that even if, you know, what do you do if the investors suddenly wake up, you know, to use the usual expression? A and I, I think here the last country in which this is likely to happen is the U.S. Uh, because there is no fundamental problem for the moment. There is no fundamental problem of debt sustainability or debt default. The debt service is still low. This is an issue far in the future. Uh, and the uh, bond market, the U.S. bond market, will remain the deep liquid market that people want to uh, be in for quite a while. So there are risks, but I'm not sure that they are very large for the U.S., and I'm not sure that major fiscal consolidation starting now 
would actually uh, decrease this risk very much. Well, as you say, starting now. So actually, let's bring that to the here and now, because uh, at the end of this uh, fiscal year in September, the uh, budget cap, the uh, temporary um, relief from the budget caps expires, and on current law, there will be a significant contraction in discretionary spending. There's significant fights ahead on Capitol Hill about what to do about that. What, in your view, Olivier, should we be doing? Should we allow that type of consolidation to occur right now? I mean, the economy is, after all, growing. I mean. Keynes did say the time for austerity is the boom, not the bust, and this kind of feels like a boom. Is well, that again, a again, I mean, you know, the, the, the very recent issue is are we running into, are we heading to a recession? If we're heading to a recession, then almost surely uh, you don't want to have fiscal consolidation at that point. But leaving this aside, uh, suppose that the economy continues to basically have the same level of private demand. Uh, if you basically have a fiscal consolidation, say, of 1% of GDP, this implies that the Fed, in order to offset it, would have to decrease the rate by 100, 150 basis points. I don't know if Kent and uh, my, panelist, uh, my panel members would, uh, would agree with that. But we would get very close, then back to very, very low rates. I would be a bit worried. So I think if, if there is no whiff of recession, I would probably decrease the primary deficit a bit, but not much, not as much as is implied by just letting these things end. Uh, Beth Ann, what do you think? Should those uh, budget caps be allowed to bind once again? What are, what are the risks? Um, so in terms, you're talking about the, are we talking about the? So if I recall debt correctly. Uh, the debt ceiling. The um, debt ceiling. Um, well, not just the debt ceiling, ceiling, but I believe that there are budget caps that have been put in place as part of the 2000. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah that, um, gosh. And um, uh, we're now up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, the back in the day, day. Yeah. gosh. Yeah. Uh, the, um, so, I mean, well, they're rather small from what I think about it. When you're talking about the, the budget caps that would go into place, they're rather small. Now, would they, would they, right now we see the expansion. So in terms of where we are, kind of back to what uh, Olivia say, was saying, that uh, we see the expansion. We do see a slowdown in the expansion. The question is, is it a soft patch or quicksand? Right now we still think it's a soft patch. Uh, we're seeing uh, growth slowing in 2019 to, it's going to feel like uh, a quicksand to some, but it looks like it's slowing to still above, above trend growth at around 2.4% this year, slowing further in 2020. Um, I think that um, in terms of what we can expect from Capitol Hill, I. Uh, you know, the the timing would be could, you could see a small kind of consol um, consol uh, consolidation, but rather you don't need to move too quickly. I suspect right now we'll see what lawmakers say on that. Um, given that we are seeing um, we are seeing a bit of a slowdown, we see the Fed worrying. We also see the trade dispute adding even more fire to the uh, more uh, more uh, fuel to the fire. Um, I suspect now would be a time to kind of take a break. So I guess the central question is, so even if you don't want to like get the debt to GDP ratio down, on current law and current policy, it's going to go up. And so some austerity would be necessary just to stabilize the debt to GDP ratio. We could start this fall by allowing the caps to bind partially or completely. Ken, I guess the quick key question is, should we? Should we at least now aim to at least stabilize the debt to GDP ratio? Yeah, so I actually am one of the few economists that like things like budget caps and, you know, um, and, uh, having this annual or semi-annual discussion about the debt ceiling, things like that, simply because it forces that conversation. Normally economists think that these caps are so arbitrary, why would we impose those on ourselves? I think it's good to have those conversations. Um, the real issue that makes, you know, keeps me up at night is the issue that we know Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, especially in terms of long-term care, um, are facing enormous pressures right now. When I think about retirement adequacy in the United States, if I thought those programs were fully funded, I wouldn't be re really worried about retirement adequacy, all the baby boomers going into retirement. Um, 10,000 a day, you know, uh, up until around 2035. The real issue is that if we don't make some sacrifice now, where is the room in the future for trying to deal with some of these shortfalls and the significant risk in these programs as well? And so I would actually be um, cutting um, uh, spending uh, more and more over time. I agree. Uh, it, you can have a compounding effect. If we are uh, reducing spending, we can get a compounding effect from that. Uh, do we have to be super aggressive about it? No, no, uh, we, we don't. But we, we should, I think, uh, start in that path of thinking uh, very seriously how to uh, deal with the shortfalls in a lot of these programs. You know, right now, I think capital markets are pricing in the idea that we are going to 
uh, figure it out somehow. Um, and there's not gonna, it's not going to require monetization of the Fed. Yeah, it, it does remind me, though, uh, some of the risks that both uh, panelists have brought up. Fifteen years ago or so, Ken Rogoff and I were brought in by a company called Lehman Brothers <laughs> to talk about, they were the biggest fixed income house in, at the time, to talk uh, with their fixed income investors. And it, they, I gave my spiel on where the economy was headed and where I thought that that situation even then was headed because it was fairly predictable. And you know, the, a lot of the Lehman Brother uh, fixed income investors were like, you know, we completely, you know, we we got, we we like this idea of rational expectations, and that's speaking our language up here. If you look at Olivia's textbook, rational expectations, forward-looking markets, and so forth. And then Ken and I asked them to define what they meant by rational expectations, and they said, you know, we jump when everybody else jumps, <laughs> and, and it was just just the opposite of rational expectations. It was a very myopic expectations. And that's the thing that scares me about fixed income markets. I agree with Olivia that the U.S. is very big. 4% of the world's population, 25% of the world's capital stock. The argument is, where's the money going to go? Um, other countries are screwed up too, so therefore. Um, so I agree we're not going to have an Asian currency crisis and things like that. But it's the slow burn, the slow uh, impact on capital formation. Um, even things like even TFP eventually could be affected by this, depending on what model you believe. Um, uh, and it's that, that slowness that we could really be stuck in this kind of lost generation for generations and generations if we don't uh, take action today, even on a, on a moderate, you know, compounded basis. Olivia. So two things. I think we should not make a fetish of a debt to GDP ratio. The debt is a stock, GDP is a flow. What matters more is debt service. Uh, this could increase if interest rates increase, but that's at a fairly low level historically. So I don't think we should just say we, we have to really keep the debt to GDP ratio okay. constant. We have yeah. to think about what we do. If it implies a small increase in debt for what debt to GDP, okay. Yeah. And I in that context, I fully agree, I think, with, with both of you, which is that social security is basically the elephant mm -hmm. in the future room. And we have and to Medicare, start yeah. now. But these reforms typically kind of, uh, you know, don't have very short run implications for the budget. You basically plan a set of changes which will affect future generations, but it has to be done in advance. And this is how the successful ones have happened. So I, I'd be perfectly happy if there's a recession or even if there's no recession, <laughs> but that to GDP <laughs> ratio increases a bit, but we do something on social security. I gotta add one more thing. Um, I, <laughs> it's hard to say happy with a recession, but <laughs> um, I would say that um, one of the things would, would be, I think, a positive would be moving away the story, may, moving away the story on Capitol Hill from the debt ceiling towards something that's a bit more productive or a lot more productive, say, say moving towards pay as you go, uh, something that was in place a long time ago. That would be something that probably would comfort markets um, here and abroad and would be a positive. Thanks. Uh, by the way, I'll be uh, taking any questions that you have in a few minutes. I think you can email them to me um, and I can uh, pick them up here. But I just wanted to sort of like stay on this issue of the possibility of a crisis. Because, um, Olivia, even in your articles, though you're sort of like downplaying the catastrophic nature of debt, you do say there are circumstances in which the interest rate to uh, below the growth rate um, situation we have now, it can flip, you know? And it has in the sure. past. It flipped in the United States in the 60s and the 70s. It flipped in Italy just a year or two ago. So how do we, uh, first of all, how seriously should we take that risk? Number two, are there any sort of warning signs or sort of like fundamental changes that we should be especially careful about encountering as, because those are the kinds of things that would actually foreshadow a sudden change in the interest rate to growth relationship and the onset of all these dangerous dynamics? Yes, no, I, I've worried very much about this and R minus G, to, uh, to be technical, uh, can flip sign, right? The question is why. So I, I, I can think of three reasons. The first one is that we accumulate so much debt, and Ken is right that this increases the equilibrium rate, and that goes above. This would be a very slow process, mm -hmm. and there would be time to adjust. We'd, we'd have to adjust. The second is that, to be perfectly frank, we do not, at least I do not, I don't want to talk for the profession, We've had this steady decrease in the interest rate since the mid-80s, continuing a bit more in the crisis, but you know, continuing now. And we have no explanation, or another way of saying this, we have 10 explanations, and I worry a bit. So 
I'm comforted with the idea that the trend is so strong that it's likely to continue. But given that I'm not sure I understand exactly what's behind it, whether it's a demand for safe assets or a different type of investment, the world of intangibles, all these things which have been discussed, I think it could turn around. So I do not exclude the possibility that the equilibrium interest rate, if you want to uh, use that word, would go up. Again, I think it would be a slow process, in which case, you know, if, if it happened and you invite me again in five years and I is higher, I will basically say, well, I have the same approach, but the numbers are different and therefore you have to reduce that. Uh, the third one, which I think is the most relevant for most countries, particularly in Japan, but I think in the US, is again, kind of this sudden stop Latin American thing, in which the investors suddenly wake up and say, well, end of the world, we sell. Now, what's interesting in this case is if the investors are scared for no reason, except that if the other ones are scared and you want to get out before they do, uh, that's something that the Fed can deal with. I mean, in Japan, one of the main reasons why they're able to maintain these very low nominal rates is that they give a BOJ, the Bank of Japan, has said, I will maintain the long rate at that level. If you sell bonds, I'll buy them. So when you have a big player like the BOJ in front of you, then you're not terribly worried about the rate going up because you know they're going to buy. So if it's a liquidity issue or a certain stop issue, not a fundamental sustainability issue, then I think the Fed would probably be able to avoid it. So first reason, there'll be time to adjust. Second reason, there'll probably be time to adjust. Third, which is a sudden stop, a sudden increase in rates, I think the Fed could avoid it. Well, it's interesting you bring up Japan, and because earlier you made a reference to modern monetary theory, and for those who aren't familiar with the term, it's essentially an idea that's been kicking around for a number of decades, which basically says that we can borrow and spend as much as we wish to get the economy to full employment because we control our own currency so we can't go broke. And there are those who argue that Japan is exactly any, uh, proof of this concept. So, Ken, let me put the question to you. Given that our central bank can buy as much debt as it wishes, and in fact has done so for the last few years, does that in some sense neutralize the bond vigilantes and mean that we really don't have to worry about some of the ill effects that we've been talking about? Certainly there's potential for a little bit of that. I mean, but it's, um, what we've seen in the last several decades is baby boomers obviously saving a lot for retirement. And it's not just the amount of savings that's gone up. Uh, sometimes people call this a, a, a capital um, uh, a bulge, but it's also they change their portfolios as they g get closer to retirement towards safer debt. And so that's what a lot of the models are missing is that shift in portfolios toward retirement. Um, and, but it's when it comes to a mon monetary theory, and unfortunately I'm used as a poster child by one of the main advocates of, of my previous comments where they take non-adjacent quotes and put them next to each other. Um, but the fact of the matter is um, the debt has been a big issue in various states in the United States, California, New Jersey. We're seeing a crowd out at the public policy level of things that they can now afford because they're trying to deal with the big debt shortfalls in those states. Um, and so monetary theory, I think, is missing the point, and that is the, the, the statement is that we can keep on printing money until we have inflation. But the problem there is that when the inflation comes, it's way too late. I had Alan Greenspan on campus about a month ago. We were talking about this, and we were alluded a little bit to monetary theory. And he agreed that you know the problem with inflation is that it's not like you can just turn off the hose at that point. It's, it's too late at that point. And it's not like you just undo the switch. And so um, I think you know, being, uh, focusing still on being fiscally uh, uh, restrained, um, maintaining the, a proper deficit, you know, a flow to flow ratio. Um, yes, there are times when monetization can be useful if you believe in some type of traps that you may be in um, in the economy. Uh, Japan, if anything, was too slow at monetizing some of its debt uh, years ago. Um, but that's certainly not going to deal with a 190% debt GDP ratio without creating massive inflation. Right, so we used to talk about fiscal dominance, the risk that anything the central bank tried to do in terms of controlling inflation would be overwhelmed by the need to finance budget debt. And we can actually do a sort of like a uh, instrumental variable approach here. You can look at Argentina versus Japan. Japan's debt to GDP is actually higher than Argentina's, and the Bank of Japan monetizes more of it than the Central Bank of Argentina. The Central Bank of Argentina has a huge inflation problem and debt sustainability problem, and Japan does not. Why is it? Why do some countries become Japan and some become can Argentina? I, 
So I'm going to use this to actually say what I think about MNT, which okay. <laughs> I've been waiting to do for, <laughs> for a long time. Uh, so I think there are two parts to it. Uh, the emphasis on fiscal policy as being a useful tool, I buy. Uh, not, no, this doesn't make them unique. I mean, most, most of us would buy that. The notion that you can finance this by money is wrong. It's plain wrong. And we do it in the US, but what does the Fed do? It basically buys bonds and it issues reserves. Now, that's money. But there's interest on reserves. So in effect, if you consolidate the government between the Treasury <laughs> and the Fed, it's just a transformation. And basically, they are it, what they are doing is issuing debt. Right? So in that context, they are not issuing money. If they issued money at zero rate, right, then we would have hyperinflation. But we are basically issuing a new form of debt, which is bank reserves, which is basically costly to the Treasury and the Fed taken together. So my view is you can do fiscal policy, you can finance it by debt, but the notion that for some magical reasons you can do it for money is wrong. There is one exception to this, which is Japan, which is when you add zero, debt and money are the same thing. And so you pretend you're issuing money, right? But in effect, it's as if you were issuing debt. The day on which Japan has to basically pay a positive interest rate on bonds, it will have to pay a positive interest rate on the money. Otherwise, people will not hold it or there'll be hyperinflation. So MMT is right for half and wrong for the other. So how do we know which half we're going to be in? If we go back to zero rates, then indeed, in this case, we will be able to finance the deficit for money. And okay. it will be Japan. All right. <laughs> That's the first time I've heard us being like Japan being described as a good thing. The, um, the, okay, I have an audience question here I'd like to ask everybody about, and it's a good one. What do you guys think about the enormous economic cost of climate change, and how should those costs change our budget? Indeed, it's kind of relevant because we were just talking about modern monetary theory. One of the things advocates of modern monetary theory want to do with all that money that we print is to finance a Green New Deal. What do folks, what, what do you think about that, Kent? I mean, yeah, it, it's not clear what the Green New Deal is, but I'll say two things. One is that, um, there's probably no area where there's more agreement amongst liberal and conservative economists in that that is on carbon. And in, and in particular, the need for something like a carbon tax or some type of tradable permits uh, to, to, to deal with carbon. Um, when you have conservatives like Marty Feldstein and liberals on the other side who are agreeing on this issue, you know, I think everybody needs to kind of take notice on this. At the same time, as we know, it's really challenging for our country by itself to deal with carbon because it's, the, it's what we call the world's perfect externality. It doesn't really matter where it's produced. It's not like sulfur. It, it really doesn't matter where it's produced. And, uh, and then you have this classic prisoner's dilemma game where you want everybody else to deal with carbon and not yourself. And, and so we're stuck in this dominant strategy equilibrium where no one wants to actually deal with it. Well, we know how to try to deal with these problems and that's using treaties, using um, things like that. They have not always been effective. Um, but that is really the only solution that we have, is to try to come up with rational international treaties and to try to coordinate our taxation of carbon, or at least um, our levels uh, of, of carbon. So I don't think there's any question, but the di difference I would have with the Green New Deal, there's also, I think, pretty broad ag agreement amongst economists, both liberal and conservative, that the government shouldn't be prescriptive of saying, here's how industry is going to deal with carbon. You're going to put scrubbers in. You're going to um, do this, use these high efficiency machines. Leave it to the market to decide how to do it. The government decides the target of carbon, whether it's using tradable pollution rights or trying to figure out the right carbon tax. But then leave it to the market to figure out how to hit those targets. And where I think the Green New Deal um, deviates and really goes back to, in some sense, a really old 1950s, 60s, you know, pollution type control is the command and control of uh, a heavy prescription on exactly how to achieve those goals. I, w I was going to add that the, in terms of, uh, you know, kind of in line with what Ken was saying, that you have, uh, you need to have many players, and particularly the two big players, U.S. and China, who are the most pollu you know, the pol most pollutant, I guess you could say, of the world involved. When we saw the U.S. move away from the Paris Accord, when we saw uh, a number of uh, a number of actions, policy actions that had been softened or, or unwound um, in terms of that were tied to environmental concerns. It's, it's certainly an issue and a concern. However, I would say that one positive we're seeing is that 
as, as Ken had mentioned, market seems to be involved. You're seeing, you're seeing businesses say they want to have the green stamp of approval. Um, you also have um, certain, uh, certain uh, businesses having to change their, say, their emission standards in order to get business from EU or even California for that for that matter. So you are so there are there are ways that you're starting to see the you know you're starting to see the movement into a much more cleaner uh, world. Still, maybe not as fast as we we should go, but you are starting to see some movement, particularly on the market side. Can if I, I could, Olivia, can just I, can I just oh sure yeah. uh, piggyback right. Uh, so I think there is the issue of how we get coordination. Let, let's leave this aside, and I don't I don't want to go into the green. Uh, Green, the specific, uh, uh, the specifics of, of, of a green, uh, how's it called, green? Green New Deal. Yeah. Uh, the question is, if we're going to do something, <laughs> I think I thought that was your question. Could we finance it by debt? It seems to me that indeed, if we're going to do a whole lot for future generations, then it's not inconceivable that we can actually leave them a bit less capital and use that. Uh, if there's an intergenerational aspect to this. Uh, I think some, if we say it's about climate change and we spend a lot of money doing things now, it may make sense to have a bit more debt. Uh, there's, there's a cartoon which you may have seen in which you in 2050 and the world has come to an end. You know, it's 100 degrees everywhere. And uh, somebody says, but you know, we didn't leave you debt. Uh, I think that captures uh, the, the, the fact that if we do something for future generations, but maybe part of it, uh, should be borne by them. And, and just to add, I, mean, I think it, it, this is where I agree also agree with Olivia, and this is the explicit debt GDP ratio is a limit for many it flows with stocks. But also, there's a lot of implicit debt that's not captured by this through pay as you go programs. But there's also this debt called the carbon debt that we're leaving to future generations, which we're not figuring out what the monetary value is. We should be trying to add up all that implicit, explicit carbon debt, and everything else and figuring out what's the right trade-off between that. Well, I think another way of thinking about this problem is that let's say that we all agree that we have a little bit more fiscal room than we used to think, okay? So all else equal, we have an extra dollar of debt that we can put on the economy. Does it matter what we use that dollar for? Are there positive yeah. return projects and negative return projects? What are your, let me just go down the panel. If you have, what would you tell the policymakers if you're gonna use that extra dollar fiscal room, what would you use it for? Yeah, I mean, I absolutely. If we're really trying to afford consumption today, then that is n not a great use. And what would if be some ways of that of consumption then, today? Yeah, it, well, if anything that we're using, this, uh, you know, uh, even a pay payroll tax cut that just stimulates consumption today, it's not really being saved, things like that. Um, but what I would be using it for is, if I did have to use a dollar of debt, would be for things that have high ROI to the future that can pay them um, back, and that could be some public infrastructure projects, which we have to be careful because, you know, even though uh, we've done a lot of modeling of that, um, and it's, you really have to pick the right projects. It's very hard politically to do that. Um, but things like if I could truly get an international agreement on carbon that I believe in, that would be something I'd be willing to invest that dollar in. On me, um, in terms of where we could see some change of that, that dollar that we have, well, first I wanted to say, I had I mentioned, uh, 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 um, very on incidentally by Ken when we was talking about uh, Japan in terms of the um, demographic issues in, in, in Japan. Uh, that's also in the U.S. Um, demographics are a big play. It's one of the reasons why we have a lower for longer uh, growth forecast, a potential growth forecast, because baby boomers are leaving the market, leaving the uh, retiring, and that actually means slower growth, lost productivity, slower growth. Uh, we also It also explains that the future baby boomers are putting money into uh, more safer assets, particularly on, the, on, the, on treasuries, for example, or more so, um, safer bond assets. It's pushing downward, t pushing downward pressure on interest rates as well. But there's another factor to uh, demographics that are also at play. We have the prime age workers, people of prime age who have uh, many of them had left the workforce. This is happening way before the financial crisis. This is something that for men of prime age, you saw them, I'd say, um, leaving the pri uh, labor participation rate for men of prime age. Um, you started to see that drop. Um, I believe it actually reached close to 10% uh, decline um, several years ago from where it was. And this was something that was a long-term trend uh, where it was closer at very, much, very high later um, in the uh, late 70s and it slowly, slowly came down. Um, we see when many women leaving the workforce as well of prime age. And so these are 
factors, demographic factors, that how do we bring these people back into the workforce? So I'm wondering, using that money, um, using that money, one thing I could see um, helping in terms of to retool the workforce, because I do think automation, technological change is at, is at play, making some of these workers uh, um, skills obsolete. How do we retune these workers so that they can com they can compete and work in a much more automated um, environment? That's I think would be a good possible good use for that money. Final thoughts, Olivier. If you had an extra yeah, dollar, I you completely agree. I mean, I think if we need primary deficits to sustain demand, we should use them for the right thing. And public investment, understood, you know, as maybe and more education, professional training, and all <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah. is is the way to go. Terrific. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs> uh, we're out of time. Uh, excellent insights. Um, for the rest of the audience, um, uh, please remember to, uh, I think, polling questions. You're asked to uh, answer polling questions. And uh, please be back at 1025 for the next session. All right, thank you very much.